Our next presenter is Leah Kiddo. She's from the Physical Evidence Laboratory in Auckland, New Zealand, and she's going to be talking about condom lubricant. Kia ora, everyone. Um, as Cassandra said, I'm Leah Kiddo. I'm from Auckland in New Zealand. Um, we are a reasonably small physical evidence team. We have basically four scientists and two technicians, and I'm one of those technicians. We cover all of New Zealand, which sounds quite impressive, but with a population of four million, it's not that impressive. Um, we're quite lucky in our casework. We get to do casework as well as do research in our spare time. We've got two ways that we can get funding for um, research. One way is through master's students that come from the University of Auckland. So they come along, do a one-year project with us, and we typically put forward a project that we want some work done on. And also um, the New Zealand Police can fund some of our work as well. And what I'm presenting today was a combination of those two ways. Um, a large portion of the work that I'm presenting was done by a then master's student, Gareth Campbell, and his supervisor, Amanda Gordon. And then luckily the New Zealand Police gave us some money to continue with a little bit more um, work. And I did that along with Gareth Campbell as well. So, the importance of condom lubricant ev evidence. Um, I think everyone is noticing this. There's an apparent increase in the number of sexual assault cases involving condoms. And this is mainly due to two reasons. Um, increased media coverage and programs like CSI. And also um, there's an increased awareness of the ability to um, contract an STI. Condom lubricant evidence is helpful. It can support or refute a particular account of circumstances. And if you've got an incapacitated complainant, um, a male or female that didn't know what happened, it can help identify what happened. And also read somewhere that it could change a charge of sexual assault to an actual rate. Okay, so this previous work was carried out by Gareth Campbell. He completed his master's thesis in mid-2004 on the analysis of condom lubricants for forensic casework. Um, previous to this thesis, um, we would carry out condom lubricant casework using Fourier transform infrared. Um, but it was found that um, this pyrolysis GC mass spec could be more sensitive technique. And so Gareth's main role was to develop a um, method for pyrolysis GC mass spec that we could incorporate in our casework. He also did a very brief investigation into the persistence of um, lubricants in situ. And because of the personal nature of this investigation, it can be quite hard to get participants. And Gareth noticed this. He had five couples that were willing to help out. But only two of those couples ended up sending results in. <laughs> Helpful. Um, so the post-cortial times that Gareth um, received back were 4.5 hours, 9 hours, and 12 hours. So we decided that further research was um, required. In, in our casework, we have a general rule of thumb that from the time of um, the incident to the time of sampling, you've got about 24 hours to detect PDMS. And you've got roughly eight hours to detect PEG. Um, and since all oh, this work was all done um, using FTIR, and so if we had a more sensitive method, these time intervals would, should be a lot higher. And so we thought we'd do a little bit more study into that. We also decided that um, we needed to look at stability studies. When the police take the medical examination kits, they will store it in their call room. And then when those kits come into ESR, we'll also store them in the call room until we actually process the kits. Then the separated swabs are um, stored at room temperature until we analyze them. And we also wanted to see if biological fluids had an effect on the persistence of the lubricants. And also we wanted to see if these um, biological fluids actually masked or interfered with the pyrolysis result results. Okay, so this table um, sh was a survey that Gareth did back in 2004 of all the condom, um, condoms that were present on the New Zealand market. But this isn't a complete um, list. This is just the ones that were found in Auckland. 
um, it's quite possible that, for example, the condoms in South, the South Island might be, they might have some more or less. And also tourists and immigrants, they might bring their own condoms with them and they could be different to um, these ones. I do know, I read somewhere that Americans have nice flavoured ones like pina coladas and stuff. <laughs> but I think I'd rather, rather drink a pina colada. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as you can see on this table, there are actually only two condoms that were lubricated with PEG. And this is quite interesting. Uh, they're actually the same condom. The um, New Zealand government would subsidise these condoms, and so the extra confidence was um, rebranded, repackaged, and then sold as extra safe. And this was subsidised um, so that they're really cheap to get through doctors, sexual health, um, organizations and pharmacies. And so even though there's only two PEG con um, lubricated condoms on the market, we felt that this was really significant in the condom population. Because if you're a uni student, you go to the doctor with a common cold, you always come home with 10 packets of these condoms. <laughs> you share them around your friends, so they're really quite significant. So what we did, um, we contacted the main manufacturer and distributor of condoms in New Zealand, which is Durex, and we asked them for um, some samples of the extra confidence and confidence condoms. And now Gareth found that back in 2004, the extra confidence was um, lubricated with PEG, and the confidence were lubricated with PDMS. So they were really good. They sent us some samples free of charge. We then um, just did a quick analysis on FTIR, and found that the extra confidence ones were now lubricated with PDMS. So what Gareth did is he had a contact, so he rang them up, and he pretty much got informed that they don't use PEG to lubricate their condoms anymore. This hasn't been um, confirmed in writing yet, but due to this, we decided that we wouldn't do PEG persistent studies, and therefore we just concentrated on the PDMS ones. Um, but we'll give you a little bit, bit of background on polyethylene glycol, PEG. Um, today, we've analysed 45 lubricant cases and physical evidence. Doesn't sound like much, but it's a few. Um, of these, 18 that were negative for PDMS in the time since the incident and the sampling took place was less than eight hours. We analysed it for PEG. And to do this, in our casework, we just extract the swab with methanol and then run that on the GC mass spec. Of all those um, 18 that we tested, none of them were positive for PEG. And in fact, we've never seen PEG in a casework swab sample. Um, so we thought that, OK, maybe PEG was rapidly absorbed or the time period was um, too long. So we thought persistent studies should be carried out. But then when we learned that PEG wasn't available anymore, we thought, well, well, there seems to be no point. So we didn't do that. So we did PDMS. Um, as mentioned previously, the approximate time, um, the rule of thumb that we have is 24 hours. Of the 45 lubricant cases that we've um, analysed, 10 of these cases were positive for PDMS. So 25% of the cases were positive one of these positive cases actually had a time interval of 24 hours, and that's our kind of general rule of thumb. And so this case highlighted the fact that we needed to do some more persistent studies. So we developed a um, consent form where if the staff signed the form, then that was um, their consent, so they didn't have to send the form in, and so it was completely anonymous. We created 50 sample packs and we placed them in the male and female toilets around ESR. Each kit contained two condoms that were lubricated with PDMS and four swabs. One swab was to be taken before intercourse as a blank, and then the other one was to be taken at a specified time that we specified or as near to it as possible. Um, each kit had a short time period and also a long time period um, specified. And also the kit asks that people abstain from intercourse of the condom for at least 48 hours. 
We had an absolutely wonderful response, and out of the 50 case sample packs that put out, we had seven kits returned. Yay! <laughs> Not much, but I guess it's better than previous, and we're slowly building up our numbers. Um, our pyrolysis is set up that we employ uses a Somatsu GC mass spec. It has a um, pyrolyzer attached, which was supplied by Frontier Laboratories. It's a double shot pyrolyzer, and it employs a vertical micro furnace that attaches directly to the GC injection port via an interface needle. We also employ an auto sampler, also supplied by Frontier Laboratories which allows for continuous operation for up to 48 samples. It's very, very handy. So the extraction of our samples. Now we followed the protocol that we use for our casework, and that involved shaving off half of the swab head and extracting it with approximately 400 4, microliters of hexane. Then it is evaporated down to approximately 20 microliters using nitrogen and then it's placed into a disposable pyrolysis cup and evaporated to dryness. And this is the conditions that the samples are put through. Pyrolysis temperature is 600 degrees, and the GC oven starts at 40 degrees for two minutes, ramps at 10 degrees per minute up to 300 degrees, and then it's held there for 10 minutes. Split ratio is 100 to one. Our mass spec um, utilizes electron ionization, and the scanning range goes from 29 to 550 MZ. We use a 30 meter ultra LA column where the total run time is approximately 43 minutes. And that's when the auto sampler is very, very handy. This is just a total iron chromatograph of a pure condom um, lubricant. We pretty much just took one of those Durex condoms, rinsed it with hexane and ran the hexane extract. And as you can see, you've got your D3 through to D8 um, cyclic oglium lumos. I was going to ask how you said that before I came, but I never did. Oglumers. During Gareth's thesis, he actually um, found that the unused sterile swabs that um, are employed in the medical examination kits have trace levels of PDMS present, and this is thought to be from lubrication of the machines that make it. And so he um, developed a criteria for PDMS detection. Um, and of note is that none of the um, trace levels of the PDMS on the blanks and stuff will pass this. They only normally have the D3 cyclic species present. And so to confirm the presence of PDMS, PD, PDMS you need um, the D3 cyclic species. This includes the isotopic cluster at 207, 208 and 209, I've got a little, oh. this is just a um, mass spectrum of that D3 showing you the isotopic cluster. And then you also need the um, three additional abundant ions at 96, 133 and 191. You then also need at least two other of these cyclic species, D4, D5, D6 and D7. And to have those you need the molecular iron and then at least three of those other additional abundant ions. So the results that we got. Um, as you can see, three of these participants were actually really, really good to us and um, sent in two sample packs. So about them we would only have had four samples, so it's just fantastic. Um, at participant one, you can see that the longest time interval between um, intercourse and sampling was 35 hours. And for this, PDMS was confirmed as we had D3, D4, and D5 present. Similar with participant two, the longest time interval uh, where it was confirmed was 22.5 hours. They had a sample at 48, which um, only had D3 and D4 present, so PDMS was not confirmed. Um, participant three was quite interesting. They had negative PDMS at 34.5 hours, which you kind of expected. But they had a sample at 28 hours that was also negative. It only had D3 and D4 present. I kind of would have thought that at 28 hours you might find some. And also, more particular note, they had a sample that was taken 10.5 hours um, post intercourse. 
And at 10.5 hours, you'd, I would expect to see D3 through to D7. But for them, um, they only had D3, D4, and D6. So even though PDMS was confirmed, it didn't have all of the cyclic species. So this just goes to show that there is a lot of variation between individuals. And so oh, this is just a um, total iron chromatograph of participant two sample, 16 hours post courteous. And then you can just filter out using these irons and you get, yeah, D3 to D7 species present. So what would cause this variation? Um, you, have, you can have variation between an individual. This could involve um, the length of condom use. We didn't specify that they had to use the condom during the entire act, so may, some people may have just kind of whipped it on towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> you could also get natural changes in the um, vaginal environment due to what type, um, what part of the um, cycle the in individual's in. And also the degree of sampling can change. Um, you might be really excited that you're taking part in this really cool project. The first swab you take, so you have a really good swab. And then the next time you're like, oh, this wasn't so much fun, the sampling part anyway. And so you'll just do it really quickly. Um, so as between individuals, you, also, you have those above conditions as well that can't be controlled. But you will have um, variations due to the way that people's personal hygiene method um, and also people have a different ability to secrete lubricants. As with um, our casework, we adopted the same um, protocol where only half of the swab was extracted. And so this left us um, the ability to go back and do some more tests on those swabs. So we thought we'd look at um, time delay. If those swabs were left for three months, does the PDMS, is it still there or is it kind of affected? And so we left these swabs for um, three months and then re-extracted them. And this table shows that there was some slight differences um, between the initial and the delayed extraction. Um, for example, you've got participant two, they had a 4.5 hour time interval. And when it was first initially extracted, it had all of the cyclic species, D3 to D7. But when and after the three month time delay, we'd actually lost the D7. The only sample that had a change in um, designation was 35 hour for participant one. Um, the initial extraction, we had D3, D4, and D5, which confirmed PDMS being present. But on, after three months, D3 was only present. And so then PDMS was negative. So there are a number of reasons why um, we might have had this loss of the cyclic DMS species. Um, it could mean that the PDMS is inst unstable over time, um, but I think it's more likely that there was a decrease in the sensitivity of the instrument. One of the problems with um, pyrolysis of lubricants is that you have to make sure that your system is extremely clean. You have to make sure the liners are clean, your column doesn't have active sites, and also have a mass spec at kind of the, the sensitivity decreases with at the age of the instrument. So you've got to pretty much make sure that before I run any case, for example, I give the system a complete clean, run a PDMS sample to make sure it's sensitive enough. But this wasn't done for um, just the research. Um, also, there could have been less PDMS present. In our case where we typically take slightly more than half of the um, condom, uh, the um, swab head and we um, adopted this in this research as well, so it's possible that there was slightly less PDMS present. Um, second part of our study was to look at the persistence of PDMS in the presence of biological fluids. Um, we chose biological fluids that could be present with PDMS on swabs or on um, clothing. We wanted to first see if um, these samples degraded the PDMS um, over time via bacterial action or something similar. And then secondly, we wanted to see if these fluids would actually mask the um, peaks on the mass spec. 
The initial plan was to extract both swabs and cotton um, fabric samples that had approximately 50 micrograms of PDMS added along with the biological fluids. And we were going to extract these on day one, month one, month two, through to approximately month six. But unfortunately, instrument time is quite hard to come by in our lab. We've only got one um, GC mass spec, which is really regularly used for fire debris analysis. And also, our pyrolysis unit has a tendency to leak. It's a bit, a bit sensitive. And so um, we made a decision to extract all of these samples on these specified days and then store them in the fridge. And then we would take um, the swabs and the cotton that had been exposed for the fluids for the longest period of time, such as six months, and extract that, and we'll run that. And then if there was any changes to the PDMS, then we'd go back and look at the other time intervals. Um, and our research showed that the biological fluids appeared to have no effect on the persistence of, the, um, of PDMS, and also they didn't mask, um, mask the peaks at all. Semen was somewhat difficult to obtain. My little helper, oh sorry, my big helper, he, um, his words were he didn't feel sexy and so we didn't get the semen at all. By storing the swabs in the fridge and the cotton was stored just at room temperature. Um, since there was no apparent effect on the PDMS persistence on either the swabs or the cotton, it can be concluded that temperature that the items are stored at will have no adverse effect on the PDMS present. This is just an, um, a total iron chromatograph of um, a swab extract that had faeces added to it. A lot of the um, peaks there are actually due to the swab, not to the faeces. So it just goes to show that faeces won't mask any of these peaks. So our conclusions. Um, so now we've found out that PEG is no longer used on New Zealand condoms. We'll still, still routinely look for this in casework until we um, have had confirmation from the condom manufacturers. But we'd also still look for PEG, since it's still present in personal um, lubricants, if there's an indication that a condom and a personal lubricant was used. We're able to um, detect PDMS after 35 hours, which is a bit longer than the 24 hours that we thought for FTIR. And so we'll go and change our approximate rule of thumb. Um, it was shown that persistence varied um, between and within individuals. Um, there was no effect due to the storage temperature. Biological effects appear to have no effect on either the persistence or the PDMS, or they don't mask any of the PDMS peaks. And pyrolysis GC mass spec is a really sensitive and really good technique for PDMS analysis but you have to make sure that your system is completely clean. So that's the only downside to it. Further work. We think further work is well warranted. Um, we need more couples and more samples. We also need couples providing anal samples. So if anyone wants to take up this sort of research, it would be really, really good, because <laughs> I think we've exhausted our um, number of willing participants. So please, please help. And <laughs> um, these are the references that I relied quite heavily upon. Any questions? I also did want to say at the start of my talk that I am extremely grateful for this opportunity to come um, to this symposium, and it's been an awesome experience. I think we have a question, Leah. Yes, um, my name is Kelly Belcher. I'm from the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office in Fort Worth, Texas. I just wanted to add, just for informational purposes for the group, about 10 years ago I did a master's research thesis on lubricant studies and on strictly on persistence. And using FTIR, we did find that PDMS hung around for about 60 hours. Okay. Um, so just for the group, I had two babies and haven't written that up yet, but um, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully I intend to do that uh, soon, but just to add to that, and so certainly with PIGC, it is a potential for some number of hours um, later. And also with N9, minoxidil 9, if you're looking for that as well, it hung around for 72 hours. So that's something, that's something to consider that time may not be 
you know, as much of a factor as we think. Mm -hmm. I also didn't have much luck with PEG, and this is strictly with FTIR, not with PIGC. Thank you for that. Thanks, Leah.